Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our first online video recording for this course. Today we're going to talk about the principles of manual muscle testing. Now you already have the lecture notes and you have the picture packet and the lab. You're going to be listening to this recording prior to going to lab on Thursday, October 13th, and practicing manual muscle testing in lab with the lab assistants. Today what we're going to cover is an, is an introduction and an overview of manual muscle testing. We'll look at why muscles become weak and why they might gain strength. And then we're going to go through the considerations in muscle testing, the concepts. And finally, we're going to go through grading and then I'll go through the procedure for you. Muscle testing is a form of data collection and it's used very precisely in physical therapy. I would say in physical therapy is known for being able to do probably the best and most precise manual muscle testing of most any other healthcare provider. Part of the reason for that comes back again in our history when polio was a disease that was very prevalent in the United States and in other countries. Physical therapists were involved in helping to identify the muscles that were affected, the degree to which they were affected, and also in charting their recovery and we developed muscle testing as a profession as a way to precisely grade the strength and the recovery of those muscles. So that certainly has per persisted. We use muscle, manual muscle testing a lot um, even today. And just the term manual muscle testing, uh, we're, what, what that refers to is that we're using our hands to both provide the resistance force and also to gauge the amount of strength that the patient has. So that's as opposed to using a a, a mechanical gauge or a mechanical force measurement. The technique that we're going to be primarily using is the techniques based on uh, the development of by Florence and Henry Kendall and they were husband and wife. He was a physician and she was a physical therapist and together they developed a way to assess strength and function in muscles. So you, that's your black book, your muscles testing and function with posture and pain. The other form of muscle testing we're going to be using is the Daniels and Worthingham. And that's also a very reputable and, and well-regarded school of muscle testing. And it's very similar to the Kendall form. We're going to be using that for when we primarily for when we do the groups of muscles. So we'll use Kendall for more precise individual muscle testing. And we'll use Daniels and Worthingham for more of the group testing. You need to know a lot about muscles in order to accurately perform muscle testing. And one of the things that we need to know, of course, are the attachment sites of the muscles, the location of the muscle, the actions that the muscle performs, and we need to be able to palpate and visualize the muscles and tendons. You can see here on the, on the picture on the left, on the lateral aspect, you can see the tendon of the biceps femoris, one of the muscles that we've recently been working with. And then um, on the medial side of the leg, you can see the tendon. It's actually the semitendinosus. That's a typo. The tendon of the semitendinosus muscle. On the right, we can see very clearly the outline of the gastrocnemius, the muscle bellies of the gastrocnemius. And then kind of blending together, you can see the heel cord or the Achilles tendon as it inserts into the calcaneus. And I know that in our practice and lab, many of you are aware that on some patients you are not able to see the muscle or tendon. And so in that case, you have to be able to feel or palpate. And you can see here, this is not a muscle we've done yet, but this is a person palpating the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon on the anterior and medial aspect of the wrist. Oftentimes when we're testing muscles, it's because they're weak. And so we can't, sometimes they're so weak they can't even move the muscle or the body part. So we have to be able to both use our visual skills and our tactile skills to determine if, if muscle function is even present. Another aspect that we need to make sure that we do with any data collection is to ensure validity and reliability. And we talked about these concepts when we talked about goniometry. So just try to think for a minute, what is validity? Right, validity is the accuracy of the test that you perform. And then what's reliability? Reliability is consistency. And that's one of the reasons why we have to follow procedures closely, is so that we can both be valid or, or accurate, 
and so that as we do it from time to time, we do it in the same way to come up with consistent results. We also want to be able to use the standardized procedure so that if one person tests the person at one time and another person tests them at another time, that there are consistent results between those, those measurers as well. So I want to talk about now are some reasons why people might have muscle weakness to begin with. And one of those certainly is that the nerves aren't functioning correctly for some reason. We could be talking about nerves in the peripheral nervous system as we show here. This person has an injury to the radial nerve and we'll learn next, the next half of the semester in kinesiology too that the extensor muscles of the upper extremity are primarily innervated by the radial nerve. And so what we see here is a lack of wrist extension because of radial nerve injury. And that could be because of an injury, a blow, um, a disease to that, to that peripheral nerve. We of course also could have weakness due to central nervous system disorders such as a stroke or a spinal cord injury. We could directly have muscle involvement. So if somebody could sprain or strain or tear a muscle, that, um, they could rupture a, a tendon and that certainly after, even after the repair, surgical repair would still be weak. Or we could have direct muscle diseases like muscular dystrophy that could cause muscle weakness. Disuse atrophy is referring to just the weakness that occurs when a muscle is not exercised or used for consistently. And here we see an illustration on the right hand side. You can see a really good contour of the vastus lateralis muscle in particular. Um, and you see a pretty good vastus medialis. Whereas on the left side, of the patient, the patient's left, your right. You can see that the certainly the circumference is much less. You don't see the contour on the left quadriceps on the lateralis that you see on the right, and a little bit less, a little bit flatter appearance to the vastus medialis. And we see disuse atrophy a lot. I certainly see it in the practice I have with geriatrics, where people are just not very active due to um, surgery or disease or just general changes in lifestyle and they definitely lose muscle mass and therefore muscle strength. Another common cause of muscle weakness is what we term stretch weakness. And this is related to the concepts of length tension that we've spoken about a lot in the past in this course. You can see from this lateral view that this person does not have good posture. There's an increased thoracic kyphosis, a decreased lumbar lordosis. As a result of the thoracic kyphosis, we have elongated back extensors in that area, and we also have elongated lumbar, or er, I'm sorry, abdominal musculature. So over time, remember that muscles don't like to be out of their optimal length. So over time, the muscles saying, okay, my actin and myosin are really far apart and I don't like that. So if this is the posture I'm going to stay in, then I'm going to add sarcomeres, remember sarcomeres, it's all about the sarcomere. I'm going to add sarcomeres and if I add them side by side it's going to kind of push everything together and then my actin and myosin will be in the optimal position again. The consequence of that then is that when, when we come back, we therapists come in and we try to put this person back in their normal posture, then what do you think is happening to their actin and myosin? Right, it's getting really squished together, and so it's, what's the term? Actively insufficient. And the person then says, wow, that feels really weird, plus it's really hard to, to hold that. The other thing that happens is when we mu test their muscles, we place them into a shortened position to test them. And what we find then is that they appear weak. Where really they're not clinically weak, there's nothing wrong with the muscle itself, it's just that we've placed it into an actively insufficient position to test it. Most of the time you're going to see when we test muscles, we test them in a, an, an, in a mid-range position, which is optimal for strength. So again, what happens is over time, the muscle has added sarcomeres so that it can be in an optimal length tension position at its resting position, which has become a lengthened position then when we shorten the muscle to muscle test it, it tests weak. And that's the, that's the term stretch weakness. Certainly pain can cause muscles to appear weak. People are not able to tolerate resistance based on pain in a muscle or a tendon. 
And finally, fatigue. People can definitely demonstrate weakness if they are if those muscles are fatigued. And by fatigue, we're looking clinically or chemically that they can't maintain the calcium going out and binding because those chemicals are kind of used up. There's hope though. We can also increase muscle strength. And regardless of the, the problem initially, most of the time we can, through therapy and through exercise, can improve muscle strength. Now sometimes some of that muscle strength returns as the damaged neuro neurological structures repair. So that's what we would call neuro return or neurological return. So in the upper left you see a woman who'd had a stroke and she's working on stair climbing. And on the right hand side a man who'd had a, and on the bottom, men who have had traumatic brain injuries and they are obviously working on gait training and balance activities. So we try to enhance the neurological return, but part of it is just really waiting for the central nervous system to recover from the injury. We can also have recovery of the nerve from a disease and as I mentioned a disease could affect either the central or peripheral nervous system. We also can have recovery of the muscle after some, after some sort of injury or disease. Probably another way that you're really familiar with increasing muscle strength is to exercise to create hypertrophy of muscles. Now in the case where we have an injury where some muscles are weakened and others are normal, sometimes what happens is those normal muscles become extra strong to compensate. So that's what would be considered hypertrophy of unaffected muscle fibers. Other times we just have, again, maybe atrophy due to disuse or just have a healthy person who wants to get stronger. Then we would challenge that muscle and strengthen it and part of the way that we would see strength is that the muscle fiber would hypertrophy. Now remember, what are we adding when a muscle hypertrophies? Are we adding muscle fibers? No, we're not. We're adding actin and myosin inside the muscle fiber. So we're plumping up the individual muscle fibers or muscle cells. And you can see here an example of um, a fellow who has exercised a lot and increased his muscle bulk. We can try to normalize muscle length in order to restore posture and therefore put the muscle back into its proper length tension relationship. And finally we can try to relieve pain. You can see here this pup has, has had some uh, natural acupuncture to relieve his pain. Alright, well we've reached the end of the first part or the first video clip, so when you're ready you should go on to the second part.